May I request Professor Debendra Kumar Nayak, the first speaker for this session, to come up to the day, sir. He will be escorted by Professor Bornali Gogoi. Thank you. We would now like to... Things are more important. Uh, I'm editing uh, the journal that is published by Institute of Indian Geographers. Um, and I have been receiving a large number of uh, papers that I have, I mean, it's, it's a rewarding experience that I have to come, go through many of these papers which come and uh, in the process of editing. And uh, something that I find, uh, nowadays I find a lot, large number of papers that I receive on climate change and environment. Something very, very exciting, something very good that uh, our scholars are now, young scholars particularly are now interested in publishing papers on these burning issues. At the same time, I also saw and I, when I read, I feel a little disappointed that we continue to reproduce the same language that has been used to describe many of the important terms, important concepts that are uh, inherent writings elsewhere, particularly in the media, the way they are presenting the same terms and words that are important in, in, in expressing some of these uh, important con concepts in environment uh, while expressing their concern and environment. And I do find that there have been a lot of changes and shift in the language, um, more so in the um, media circles, not so much in academic writing. And that's why I thought and present before you some of those key changes that have taken place in the recent years um, in expressing and, and writing um, on environmental issues. And uh, this, this, this therefore uh, made me uh, share, I'm thought, I thought of sharing these issues with this august audience who is present in front of me. Many of these great scholars of the country are present here. And also young scholars who may, uh, may think over it and see if what uh, changes that I am proposing can be accepted on what are the um, pros and cons of doing it. I would like to draw your attention first to some of the headlines that are now being seen and it can be contrasted with the way we have been expressing ourselves in our writings as far as uh, these, these, uh, these environmental issues are concerned, particularly climate change. I'll be focusing on climate change, but there are other areas also in which changes are coming in great measure. Look at it. Now, once UNP, UNEP says, facts about climate emergency, then climate crisis warming should be called global heating, uh, says key scientist, The Guardian. It's a crisis, not a change. The six Guardian language changes on climate matters, the Guardian. And uh, it, Dr. Paul Chadwick says that the urgency of climate crisis needed robust new language to describe it. These are some of the uh, terms that you can see which contrasts with what we do generally write uh, while describing climate change. But it's not confined only to climate change. There are many other areas in which I will come to it very quickly and very short uh, as a presentation. I always feel that words can be weapons. If they, uh, we don't use the appropriate words, we don't use uh, uh, correct terminologies, then they don't convey the same meaning. One of the essential purposes of writing and, and speaking is to communicate. And if we don't communicate what we do say, it doesn't make much of an impact except that we increase our uh, number in our biodata. So languages certainly play a very crucial role in shaping perceptions. The terms that we employ often, in our, even in our daily life, can influence public opinion 
even policy decisions and individual action in the lingo has taken place while describing climate change uh, and this, there have been shifts in the climate change from, as I have already mentioned to you in the first slide, that climate change is being written or expressed as climate crisis or climate emergency or climate breakdown. Similarly, global warming is being described more and more, more so in the political and in the media circles, to global heating and not just global warming. We are no more uh, climate change skeptics. We generally keep skeptics at a, at a very high esteem because it's the skeptics who generally are seen to be uh, looking at things from a different perspective uh, and, uh, and lead to different set of knowledge that can progress. But when it comes to climate change with so much evidence, uh, in support of it and experience by all of us that when we continue to be skeptics about climate change and go on denying um, that it may not be taking place because of human intervention, then perhaps they are no more called skeptics, but they are called um, science deniers as a lingo change. So what's happening is that there are conventional terms that we, we continue to use as climate change or global warming, but they don't really do that much of a justice to the dramatic research findings of the climate scientists who are now warning us an impending danger and there are actions which are taking place at all levels. Uh, climate science denier or climate denier instead of climate Climate skeptic is being used because skeptics, skeptics are seeker of truth. An inquirer who has not yet arrived at definite conclusions. That's something which is generally, that's what keeps the, deny, the skeptics at a higher pedestal. Most climate skeptics in the face of overwhelming scientific evidence, if they deny climate change is happening, or is being caused by human activity, so uh, the denier is seen to be more accurate term to describe such um, skepticism than calling them skeptics and keeping them at a high esteem. As I told you earlier that uh, these changes are not simply confined to climate change, which is certainly more important uh, and more current um, as, as a topic of discussion, but it is, there's, there's a need to change, there, there are appeals to change the, our language for many other environmental issues that we do discuss. So some of the examples I'll give, but they're not the, a very comprehensive one, not exhaustive one, but a few examples would see uh, how, how change in language can be important in convincing and, and uh, making our writings much better. Say, so for example, we can ditch the term natural resources, which we use so often, to call it as Earth's gifts. Referring to nature as a resource contributes to an exploitative mindset. Earth's gift equals to gratitude and responsible stewardship, fostering deeper connection with the environment and encouraging sustainable practices. Similarly, we can now replace the term environmental degradation that's very often used in the writings with ecological unraveling. Uh, the former, that is the environmental degradation as a term, is quite abstract and quite distant. Whereas ecological unraveling conveys a sense of interconnectedness and highlights the severe consequences of disrupting delicate uh, ecosystem. Likewise, uh, we can now, we should slowly change our uh, writing um, the terms waste management, which is very uh, important, I and mean, people now in the, uh, particularly with the context of, in the context of urban, urbanization and urban waste generation, the term waste management should be replaced with resource recovery. The term uh, waste management often implies a focus on disposal rather than potential for recycling and reuse. 
Whereas resource recovery as a term emphasizes the value of materials and encourages a circular economy approach. Another example of biodiversity, we have been using biodiversity uh, in, in the context of biodiversity, we have been using the term species extinction, which must be replaced by a word, uh, a term called biodiversity loss, which appears to be far more correct and appropriate. The term species extinction is certainly accurate. I don't say that it's wrong, but may fail to capture the broader impact on ecosystem. Using the a term biodiversity loss emphasizes the interconnected wave of life, acknowledging the repercussions of losing various species on health and resilience of ecosystems. Uh, there are other examples like we have been using carbon emissions or carbon dioxide emissions in the context of climate change, which a uh, preferred term should be greenhouse gas emissions because it, 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 it's, it's uh, reductionism, uh, precisely because it's just not um, carbon emission which causes all the problems, but there are many other gases. Although carbon emission is not inaccurate, if we are talking about all gases that warm the atmosphere, this term recognizes all the climate damaging gases, including methane, nitrogen oxides, CFCs, etc. We have been using the term biodiversity, but it's suggested and recommended that we t use the term wildlife rather than biodiversity much more in our writings, because wildlife is a much more accessible word and is fair to use in many stories and is a bit less clinical when talking about all the creatures with whom we share the planet. Similarly, we sometimes use the term fish stocks. Uh, what is being recommended, what is being thought as far more appropriate is fish populations. This change emphasizes that fish do not exist solely to be harvested by humans. They play a vital role in the natural health of the oceans. But if what I'm suggesting appears to be given, that's not true. There are, uh, there are people who are not very well convinced that these changes are going to bring in a lot of change in our writing and our thinking. Many of them, uh, I mean, the, 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 obviously these, all these terms are far more used, as I've told you earlier, in media circles. And there's a raging debate in the media circles about what terms to be used to, uh, to better describe the uh, environmental issues. To some, such changes describe describes that something big, something threatening is taking place. That's the main objection by many, that uh, is, it, is it that we are really being threatened and something big is going to happen? The term global heating suggests something alarming. And precisely, this, is, this was and continues to be one of the problems of today's climate debate. Changing language negates debate. It actually blocks it. That's the main objection, uh, particularly by the academicians, that they think that one should not um, take a concrete position and a final position that, yes, it has taken place. And if we change the language like this, we have already taken a stand on it. Others say that rather than talking about terminology, the debate essentially should focus more on measures to tame the danger itself than engaging in the niceties of uh, change in language. The objections come particularly from German media, which doesn't accept that such changes are so very necessary. It, uh, uh, the German media say that media should be non-partisan and independent of effects and influence from parties, ideological groups, economics, and financial groups and governments. Something that, uh, as a media, um, it takes as, as an ethic that why should it take such extreme positions and it should be independent. 
So also many academics think that if we change the language like this, we may be actually taking a position uh, which may be highly ideological and not academic. The German press agency uh, has its internal rules called language compass, tries to uh, avoid alarmist words which can border on propaganda. They say that this can be propaganda. Uh, for example, uh, they say the example that, that is given by German press agency is that terms like foreign infiltration, for example, which is a propagandist notion of struggle adopted by right-wing populists and extremists, that must be a taboo that one shouldn't use foreign infiltration as a term because that would be, uh, it's, it's almost a of the term like climate crisis. He says that cri crisis is inherently episodic. Crises are either solved or they pass. Therefore, crisis is totally inappropriate for human-made climate change. We know that global warming will probably never stop. And at the same time, we know that we are infinitely far from finding a solution to the problem. According to Eckert, the concept climate crisis is therefore misleading. He also dislikes the word climate emergency. One city after another is declaring a state of climate emergency without it, without it having any real consequences. Climate change should not be superseded by climate crisis because crisis is understood as a temporary state. And while it may be far-reaching and long-lasting, it gives the impression that a return to normality is possible. That is already impossible. But few disagree to some changes that while I have give, given the, both the sides that why it should be a change and why it should not be, a, there should not be a change, but very few really disagree to some kind of change in the lingo. Eckert, the same person who has been vociferously objecting to uh, large scale changes in terminology says and admits that climate change is too weak a term for situation. He is not happy with the term climate change. I believe global heating or global emergency are better descriptors. How the subject is presented is more important than its terminology, however. Uh, Joachim Wille, an environmental editor, acknowledges that we are right to one against an imminent climate disaster or an impending climate collapse. It is common knowledge that a temperature rise of more than 1.5 or 2 degrees will lead to dramatic changes. And the world is now on the path towards a rise of 3 to 4 degrees. Uh, therefore, many find it unacceptable to use the term climate deniers uh, when it comes to climate skeptics who are considered healthy dissenters. So the dissent is more important uh, in, 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 in academic understanding and therefore to, to brush them as science deniers or climate deniers is not a good thing to do. They do not accept that part. Swiss environmentalist Mihat says, people exaggerate everything in life as a crisis. But the media describe the only existential crisis facing humanity as change. So he talks of a climate emergency uh, to be used far more, and he thinks that it's long overdue that we must be so much concerned with the problem that we are faced with, as, 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 which he describes as uh, a, a, an existential crisis, that he thinks that climate change is a too weak a word and we must use climate emergency. The lessons that we can draw from this is that words are indeed weapons. Uh, but the question is, do academics consider this semantic significant? that the semantic changes are necessary, I place before you to think over and see if we really need, and if we re really need, how much of it we really need to change so that we become more effective, we become more accurate, and we actually contribute to actions. Should we 
to take media, should we also take media lingo seriously? As I told you, the media has been using it far more, and media has a different role to play than academics. Uh, should we take some of these lessons from media, or should we not? And we continue. And there's fears of losing our autonomy if we do so as scientists and also being objective. Are we really presenting it objectively, or we are becoming more activists? That's another question. And then in the, in the research, we can have argumentative research or analytical research. Are we abandoning analytical research in favor of argumentative research only? These are questions which often come to our mind when we go for such large scale changes in language. And then the question still remains, are we not responsible? Are we just uh, there to write and forget about our responsibility to to the environment and environmental changes that are taking place. What about skepticism or activism? In any case, to conclude, in great many ways, language shapes our understanding of the world. Environmental crisis demands a vocabulary that accurately reflects its urgency and complexity. Such words and terms that I have been talking about can foster a deeper appreciation for the interconnectedness of our planet and inspire meaningful actions to address and mitigate environmental degradation. It's time to speak about our environment in a way that resonates with challenges that we face. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nayak, for raising a number of questions and issues connected with environmental change and related vocabulary we have been using. And we have learned a uh, lot of such words connected with uh, environmental change and threats we are going to face as raised by uh, policy makers education is so on and so forth uh, uh, throughout the world. And what I have understood is these uh, terms are very essential to draw attention. Attention of the people with respect to the challenges we are going to face. So we are very much thankful to Professor Nayak once again for raising uh, so many questions and thoughts. This is, these are food for thoughts for all of us. Thank you very much. We are running short of time. Now we are invite, I invite uh, one of the organizers to come forward to invite the second speaker. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We now have the second speaker, Professor Shahab Fazal. May I request Professor Shahab Fazal to kindly come up to the dais? Professor Fazal shall be felicitated by a gamusa and a memento. <laughs> Professor Sahab Fazal from the Department of Geography, Aligarh Muslim University, Aligarh, is an alumnus of the University of Ajmer and of Aligarh Muslim University. He is the recipient of postdoctoral fellowship from Fulbright and among other organizations as well. And he has served in various academic organizations in various positions, worked in several research projects, and has several academic and research publications to his credit, which have national and international significance. Professor Fazal is also a member of several significant bodies, departments, both at academic and government levels. May I request, sir, to kindly? Yes. <laughs> the mouse is not so sensitive. Still not.
Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, Cotton University and Professor Kalyandas, and IIG, <coughs> the Secretary General uh, Ravindra Jayabhai, President uh, Professor Sachidanand Sena, and all the dignitaries. Um, it's an honor and privilege for me to uh, share my views uh, in front of this August gathering. <coughs> I intend to speak on urban planning in India. Um, many of you and my personal feeling is also that it's rather urban neglect in our country uh, when we talk about uh, urban planning in our country. <coughs> and I would be using some empirical evidences to support my argument. You see, urbanization is said to be an indicator for development. Uh, but if you look into our urban settlements, um, you would find a great disconnect with the planning because the requirements are much higher, uh, whereas how much we are filling in through planning is quite um, poor in, uh, in the context of um, achieving this, the proper living condition for the people in urban area, it is quite poor. <coughs> um, just to give you some idea as to why in India urban planning is a uh, dream for all of us, uh, those who are living in urban area, because you see, it's a very enormous, uh, the population in our country is quite large, uh, although the census of India suggests that we have, we, uh, in 2011 census, we had 31% population, now um, some estimates suggest that we have reached up to 35%. But I think, and many other studies have also pointed out, that uh, the urban population is much beyond the 50% mark. Um, that itself suggests that it will be somewhere around 60, 60 crores of people living in urban area. I am saying this because when we talk about urban planning, uh, our resources directed towards the 30% population mark is much lesser than what we should do, uh, we should propose for urban planning. <clears throat> now, another important aspect is that, you see, the future lies in urban areas because every society wants to upgrade their economic activity for better living. And every society try to move on to higher order economic activity, which is possible uh, generally, uh, it, is, it has been witnessed all over the globe, is possible only in urban area. So in that context, I would say that the urbanization is something which we are moving towards and we have to move towards it. And for that matter, the urban planning is very important. This is one very basic point which I have tried to, to, to put before you. But there is much beyond that. It's not only about <clears throat> the, the urban planning in the context of how many people living in urban settlement. But then you move further. We all know that we require higher order. When, when I say higher order economic activity, we also require opportunities for the people. We also require infrastructure for the higher number of people and activities. So for all that matter, I think urban planning is required and to my mind it is uh, in some way is uh, neglect and it is also um, in a poor state. I'll skip some of the slides because uh, we have um, um, time constraint also. Now you see, in India, Traditionally, we all know that how urban settlements are growing. These are organic uh, expansion of the city. Um, and if you see, um, most of the urban centers, they are being growing by few activities or few individuals who are practicing it in a different manner, attracting more people from the hinterland and the people, uh, the population start to grow, activities start to grow. That way the urban settlements have evolved in our country. Uh, but there is one more important aspect which I would like to highlight. Traditionally, uh, in our country, um, since our country is uh, having uh, many evidences of early civilization. So right from the very beginning, the socioeconomic 
structure of our country, it makes the settlement with some element of exclusivity. And it continued right throughout the human settlement in our country. And uh, in recent time, if I can give you a good example, which, uh, which we all are familiar with, during the British period, we had the civil line concept. So this way, we have the sense of exclusivity in our urban center. And that I would try to give you, uh, give my, uh, some of my evidences, which is still continuing in modern day urban planning also. Now, why I'm saying this? Because you see, when we talk about urban planning, it has to be across the urban settlement. But most of the planning in our country, it is confined to some sectors directed to benefit few individuals, few people, few localities. And in that way, I would say that the concept of planning to, to give benefit to everyone in the settlement is not reaching up to the majority of the population. And that is also a big challenge for planners in our country. And I would say that, again, here also we are neglecting uh, in some way uh, which is reflected in our urban planning. <clears throat> I have already pointed out that the urban population in our country is substantial. Um, although the share of urban population is said to be lesser, but it is quite substantial, um, which require uh, intervention from the planners. Uh, now, um, you see, th these points uh, I would skip. Uh, I would come to the uh, empirical evidences, which would be uh, more uh, more relevant to to uh, to my argument. Uh, but briefly, if I can give you some idea, you see, I am saying uh, I want to put uh, this argument also in my discussion that urban planning in our country is at the backstage. Um, most of the uh, uh, um, in planning initiatives, it has not been directly being um, advocated as urban planning, but it is other plans where we are incorporating the um, uh, uh, incorporating some elements for urban areas. For example, if you see uh, in the first five-year plan, the emphasis was on f uh, housing rehabilitation where, because we had a large-scale migration in form uh, of uh, migrant population after the partition. So the housing was one important uh, element which we incorporated in our planning, but in some way, I would say it was directed towards the urban planning. The second five-year plan, especially um, the young student would agree that they are uh, referring to this planning period as the period where we focus lot, a lot on the, on the livelihood, where industrial development took place uh, in a big way in our country. But all these industrial development, they were directed towards some settlements, or rather I would say that these industrial uh, development resulted into development of many cities in our country. So that way, we, um, without projecting that these are the plans for urban development, we tried to, to do some kind of urban planning there. Uh, then uh, the third plan was directed towards regional development, but here, uh, the idea was that uh, the the urban uh, the migration was taking place in the earlier uh, period started to uh, happen in the earlier period so we had some nodes nodes which can result uh, in restricting the the major flow of people to the urban areas i want to say that that this way we did the urban planning in with the backstage of, we put the urban planning at the backstage, we uh, thought of planning something else, and in uh, continuation and in uh, hand in hand, we also tried to, to plan for urban areas. And in the recent times, uh, especially um, after the, uh, there were many plans, I'll skip that, but in the recent time, you would see that there has been uh, JNN, JNN, URM, uh, UID, SSMT, Amrut, Hriday, Swach, all these plans have also come up. <coughs> but I would say that, as I have said earlier also, that the 
allocations of money was far less than what what we require for urban planning now this is also one very important issue in our urban planning where the allocations were far less than what is actually required and that resulted into failure of most of the uh, urban planning initiatives which have been taken directly or indirectly uh, so this is what the background on which uh, i i build my argument about the neglect in urban planning now there are two plans which we commonly we know about uh, for the urban areas one is the master plan which um, most of the urban centers uh, i think not actually most but somewhere around 2700 cities have been targeted in different period of time um, to upgrade or to um, improve the urban areas uh now if you have come across the uh, the master plan document or the master plan map uh it is the uh, essentially a land use plan and this land use plan is uh, proposed by the city development authority in order to to match the requirement of increase population in any settlement so um, uh, the example which i would be uh, showing you is for the city from where i come I, it's uh, aligarh and there uh, we had two successive master plan where one is between 1980 to 2000 and then uh, in 2001 to 2021 so we had two successive master plan and both of them they are essentially as i am saying it's the land use plan um considering the projections of population from the census data as to how it is increasing and how much land should be allocated to different uh, purposes for the uh, better living in the urban area now here i would uh, uh, i would try to highlight that most of the um, uh, master plans they have not succeeded in achieving their targets in any of the city uh, as i am saying that uh, in our country uh, some uh, almost 3 uh, you can take 3000 cities uh, they had a uh, master plan but they have not succeeded in achieving their targets and what happens um, there are examples which suggest that there is large scale violation and in newer master plan they have been most of them they have been regularized so this this kind of planning is happening uh, uh, under the master plan then another uh, a recent one which is talked a lot hyped a lot is of smart city and i would say that smart city is also more of a retrofitting kind of thing where some pockets some uh, areas and some projects were um, given importance and they have been developed so um, but the important fact of, of smart, smart city was that there were some uh, money which was coming into into the planning uh, somewhere around 50% was um, uh, contributed by the um, central government and rest uh, is being generated by local government and uh, other res resources but this is also i would say again that it's more of a retrofitting which which uh, which is uh, being achieved uh, which is being targeted uh, uh, from smart city now um uh, very quickly if i can uh, come to to the the us uh, uh, how uh, what are the evidences uh, in support of my argument of urban neglect uh, you see this is the aligarh city um which is located in the northern part of india now this is the city which has the keys are not functioning <laughs> it's not moving so this how this is how it is uh, um, expanding which is quite obvious and it is expanding uh, in the peripheral area of of the city um, very quickly the land use change from 1980 i have taken this time slot only because um, the the master plan period started in 1981 so this is the 1980 um, map this is 2000 and this is uh, 2000 2020 so <clears throat> this map gives you an idea that how the city is expanding and if if i can go uh, uh, if i can give you a little more detail 
the the central part is the the residential part so this is um, the built up area which is coming up now come to the master plan that's very interesting you see if you have ever uh, looked into the any master plan map it's not actually a map it's more of a sketch uh, the engineer sketch which is <coughs> not up uh, it, it is not up to the scale <clears throat> it's only reflective of distances um, and the perimeters are not actual uh, uh, perimeter of of any any land use which is being proposed by by <clears throat> Uh, the uh, the master plan i am saying this because those uh, who use gis it is very difficult to geo reference them and if you uh, geo reference them then you have to make some kind of adjustment into into the map so that is uh, one very important issue for the master plan map so i did this uh, and this is what the original master plan uh, for aligarh city between 2001 and 2021 and when i uh, brought it into gis environment uh so this is the 1980 status of settlement which was regularized whatever uh, violations were um, happened uh, which happened in uh, between 1980 and 2000 it was regularized by the development authority and uh, this was the status of built up area in 2001 then they proposed on the basis of the requirement for different land use classes especially i would like to draw your attention on open spaces green spaces in institutional uh, buildings um, uh, institutional areas they have allocated a lot many land to uh, in the 2021 census uh, 2021 uh, master plan but it has not been realized that i would try to show you and the peripheral area even the city master plan have advocated and allotted to the agricultural land so that's also an important issue which you need to understand as to what kind of urban planning we are doing where we are protecting the agricultural land now i am saying this in the context of livelihood opportunity so we are not focusing on on uh, providing opportunities higher order economic op opportunities for the people um, which is increasing in number um, uh, in each census year but we are protecting the agricultural land so there is some kind of dichotomy also in rural and urban planning um, which is existing in urban planning in our country uh, so this is the agricultural land now very quickly <coughs> the slides are not moving so this is the the status of uh, 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 master plan um, after the the completion of of uh, uh, the plan period this is the area where which was developed according to the plans so it's roughly around 30% of the total land uh, but there there is violations now this is very interesting that violations are those land use which were proposed but it has not come up um, some other land use classes have come up now it's an interesting story which i would very quickly try to give you and this much area remained undeveloped now it's again interesting that 30% was developed according to the master plan 60% remain undeveloped and where there is 10% was violation and of this 10% the slides are not moving these are individual land use classes um, where i am saying that uh, uh, how the violation which land use class uh, violation was um, uh, witnessed in the study area and now this is again interesting <coughs> you see i said uh, 10% violation 30% according to the master plan and 60% remained um, uh, unrealized plans on these unrealized plans there have been individual land owners who have procured the land the land transformation has take has not actually taken place but in near future here also the violation would take place so 10 plus 15 somewhere around 25% of violation is uh, is uh, being witnessed um, in the, in uh, the aligarh city 
Um, I'll skip that and very quickly if I can give you the, the status of master plan, which is again um, in, in, in the city, Aligarh city, we had 55 projects, uh, but only um, 11 projects have been completed, 27 projects are still continuing. Now you see, this is again interesting, why? Because you see, it was focused to few activities, few infrastructure and few areas and that is also not being realized despite of the fact that this time in the planning um, some funding was available, the money was available uh, for the development. But we all know that how the money percolates down to the, to the contractor and if there is some kind of uh, disconnect between the flow, it result into um, unrealization of, of the plans. That is also one very important issue. And very quickly, I will give you, uh, yes, I'm concluding, sir. It's actually the slides are not moving <laughs> to my. Um, so uh, there, traffic congestion was one important issue. So, so in the master plan, uh, there have been some areas where um, some um, uh, smart junctions was proposed. They have been um, uh, completed. Most of them, they have been completed. And also, uh, <coughs> some water supply um, schemes were there. Now, here again, I would say that it was not for the entire municipal limit boundary. You see, most of the urban planning requires beyond the municipal limit. So here in smart city, we are only confining ourselves to the municipal limit and there also we have not been able to realize whatever we are trying to achieve. So the water supply through pipeline is not still happening in, 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 uh, in Aligarh city and some pockets were identified where underground water uh, supply, drinking water supply was proposed. Uh, and to some level it has been achieved. Um, this is the, the uh, area. Water harvesting uh, phases, first phase one has been achieved, but phase two is still pending. So this is also lagging um, there. Uh, I'll skip all that. Uh, then solid waste management, again, you see, solid waste management is another interesting um, uh, uh, area where we need to plan much more effectively because whatever plans uh, under the smart city mission was, um, uh, happened in, in Aligarh city, it is far less than what is required. So what is happening, this kind of uh, bins were installed, but uh, they have, they are not um, uh, beyond the capacity. So every, uh, everything is spread all over these, these uh, bins where, uh, which was, uh, which was to be collecting uh, the garbage. Now, very quickly, uh, one more minute I, I will take. There were, there have been two flagship projects uh, in Aligarh city. Now, any one of you, if you are familiar with uh, the um, uh, Aligarh topography, uh, near the university area, there was, uh, one small water body and on that water body we had constructed one habitat center or a commercial building uh, this was one uh, one of the initiative my point here is that if you take into the sustainability and environment uh, dimension if if you want to bring into the urban uh, planning this is a great concern for all of us and it is started uh, to impact the people also uh, in Aligarh city why because uh, it has been built in a in a in a water body on a water body um, um, the lal diggi tal uh, i think um, uh, atiya ma'am can if he, if she can recall uh, the lal diggi tal at that uh, water body which uh, which was acting as sponge for for the nearby area now it has been uh, uh, converted into a commercial center uh, this is the site and this is how it is appearing very beautiful uh, aesthetically it's appearing very good but actually this water body is now lined and the 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 sides of it has been elevated, not only elevated but also sealed, so no water can um, uh, move 
uh, in, and it has become now an artificial body, water body. The another is another water body, Achaltal, which is in the older part of the city where a, a, a large statue has been um, uh, erected there. So this, nat these two natural bodies, I want to say that these are the flagship projects which were intended to improve the city situation, but actually what has happened, for example, this uh, uh, habitat center near, near the university, last year in October, we had um, two, three days of excessive rainfall, and it resulted into flooding of the entire area, uh, where the civil line area was submerged into the water, because, because this water body is no, no longer uh, is, uh, now existing, it's, it has turned transform into a settlement. So this is uh, the Achaltal. And one more important point, very quickly, if I can show you, um, just last uh, point which I want to make. You see, this is the result of urban planning, um, uh, unsuccessful urban planning. You see, in, during the master plans, when I said that there have been violations, now these violations of, say, one meter, when one meter of encroaching on the roads, this has happened in Aligarh a lot because it's a small city. Now, what happened when the, the uh, I have mentioned that during the smart city uh, there was widening of road because traffic congestion was one important problem. So, what happened? This one meter encroachment when they started to demolish it appeared like this. Uh, you see, these are the examples of it. So you see how the resources are being um, uh, used and misused in our country. It, it is not of any Philistine or um, uh, Afghanistan. It is a city in India where when um, encroachments are being demolished, it appears like this. Uh, it's the Dodpur area, uh, a congested area, but now it's also I talked about ex exclusivity, but it is also reflected in the demolitions where uh, some areas have been ignored and some areas have been uh, demolished uh, in such a way that the people and the society has uh, affected a lot. Uh, and then last slide, sir. You see, this is a good example that how we are planning, how we are executing, and what is the final result. You see, this is the center point, which is uh, the commercial hub, a new commercial hub of uh, Aligarh city. Um, on the left side, uh, uh, there you see this. This is what we proposed and we achieved. And on the right side, you can see that this is the present situation, where the footpath has already been encroached upon by the, by the shopkeepers. So you see, at the heart of the city, which is the prime location, if this is the status of our planning, then you can understand that why the urban planning, I'm, why I am saying as urban planning as urban neglect. Why? Because we require interventions from all the concerned institutions, not only institutions, but also all the, all the um, stakeholders who are associated with the urban planning. If we won't be doing this properly, then this is a small city, but it is evident in larger cities also. Uh, and that is where I would say that we would be lagging behind in achieving desired development. Thanks a lot. So, encroachment has become the rule wherever we go. Uh, we have already encroached upon another important session. And we are really very much thankful to, this is not his fault, our speaker. Actually, we started the program late. I do not want to blame uh, our speaker. Uh, rather, I am very much thankful to Professor Saab Fazal for illuminating the uh, planning aspects of urban development in our country, including the master city concept and its uh, strategies involved in the carrying out the policies with respect to development of smart cities in our country, with an example from his own city of Aligarh. So this is another important uh, deliberation we have listened to. In both the deliberations, uh, uh, 
uh, one in Professor Nayak talked about the uh, impacts of development on environment, how we face lots of threat in our environment. And here uh, in the uh, speech delivered by Professor Saha Fazal, this is connected with development. We want development. Urban growth is taking place very fast. Although in proportion in India it is very small, only one third. But in terms of its size of population, it is huge. That is why planning has become very important, but there are gaps and lapses. So as a researcher, we have to identify those lapses and gaps. These are the duties of the researchers. And I call upon our young uh, geographers and researchers to take up such works in their uh, forthcoming research works. With these words, I thank the organizers for having given me this opportunity to be with these two illuminate, illuminating speakers, Professor Nayak and Professor Saha Fazal, uh, uh, taking up with two important topics during this plenary lecture session. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. As we are running short of time, we shall now straight away proceed to the first Ajazuddin Ahmed Memorial Lecture, which will be delivered by Professor Atiya Habib Kidwai. The lecture is being chaired by Janab Sohel Hashmi. May I request members from the organizing committee to kindly escort Janab Sohel Hashmi and Professor Atiya Habib Kidwai to the dais. Janab Sohel Hashmi, the chair for the memorial lecture, has been a freelance historian, heritage expert, linguist, and filmmaker. He has contributed to the domain of teaching and learning in geography with his textbooks for so school. A recipient of Intac Heritage Award in 2022, Janab Hashmi has authored Sachi, Where Tigers Fly and Lions Have Horns, as a part of the UNESCO World Heritage Sites of India series. May I request the organizers to felicitate Janab so hail Hashmi. Thank you. Professor Atiya Habib Kidwai is a geographer and a professionally trained regional planner from IIT Kharagpur. Her teaching and research spanning almost half a century includes three years at the Department of Architecture and Regional Planning, IIT Kharagpur, 41 years at the Center for Study of Regional Development, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and five years at the Department of Regional Planning, School of Planning and Architecture, New Delhi. She has been a Rhodes Visiting Scholar and a Senior Fulbright Fellow at the University Cities of Chicago and Illinois. She has had a long and multifaceted interaction with French geography and geographers as the director of studies at Maison de Sciences Les Home Paris and three times visiting professor at universities in Paris. She was a founder member of the International Geographical Union Commission on Third World Development and director of the training workshop of the Commonwealth Geographical Bureau held in India. She has served as a member of National Commission for Promotion of Social and Economic Welfare Ministry of Finance, Government of India, the National Capital Region Planning Board India, the Delhi Urban Arts Commission and various bodies of the Institute of Town Planners India. May I request the members of the organizing committee to kindly felicitate ma'am.
May I now request Professor Sachidanan, President of IIG, to kindly speak about the first Ajazuddin Ahmed Memorial Lecture. Okay. Yeah, uh, friends, uh, it's an honor uh, to introduce the two dignitaries this morning, uh, particularly uh, uh, within uh, the framework of uh, the first memorial lecture that we are going to have in the in honor of Professor Ahmed. In fact, this is long overdue. We should have started this uh, almost a decade before, uh, but better late than never. Uh, I believe uh, both the chair and the speaker, they have had a very long association with Professor Ahmed. Uh, Professor Atiyah Habib Kidwai joined JNU a little before Professor Ahmed joined, and therefore she had a long innings to uh, associate with him, and therefore has seen the department, both the CSRD um, and the curriculum develop together, along with Professor Ahmed. <coughs> And uh, uh, Sohail Hashmi Sahab, pehle batch ke student hain, us center ke jahan Professor Ahmed aaye. To mere khayal se unse behtar koi, in do logo se behtar koi nahi soch sakte the ham. Aur hume bahut khushi hai ki aap dono yahan pe tarshif lai hain. Aur hamara to man badhai hai. Aur khas karke ye ek homage hoga hamare us uh, geographer ke liye aur social scientist ke liye jinhone geography ko ek naya maqam pe pahunchaya aur ek naya rukh bhi diya to mujhe ummeed hai ki aap sabhi professor ahmed ke kaam ko bhi dekhenge bas ek guzarish rahegi ki agar ant mein thoda sa samay milega to hum ek choti video hai wo bhi hum dikhane ki koshish karenge jo ki aur uske liye aap thoda jame rahe to acha hai shukriya May I request the Chair, Janab Sohail Hashmi, to kindly take over the proceedings. I had never in my wildest dreams imagined that I'll be chairing a session where Professor Atiya Habib will be speaking. Atiya Appa is my senior. When I joined JNU in the first MA batch, Atiya Appa was already doing her PhD. And she introduced us to an entirely new discipline because we hadn't studied that in our college. That was urban geography. And uh, my association with Atiya Appa and with, with Ajaz Sahab lasted fairly long. I did my MA there, I did my MPhil there, and I also worked on a PhD which I didn't finish finally. But for that period, Atiya Appa and Ajaz Sahab were there. And uh, they were guides and they were inspirations. So it is uh, I am grateful to the organizers for giving me the honor to chair this session. And uh, Ati Appa will speak about Ajaz Sahab or will give a memorial lecture, the first memorial lecture. And I am really grateful for uh, the IIG for having instituted this memorial lecture. Because Ajaz Sahab was one of those people who made a seminal contribution in transforming geography as it had been taught during the colonial period into a subject that could grow into a social science. And the engagements of Ajaz Sahab 
his study of uh, linguistic diversity, his uh, contribution to accessibility and denial of accessibility and its impact on education, especially among marginalized communities, scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, and how inbuilt biases in a society operated through things that uh, were presented to you as natural barriers. And it is, we began to look at natural barriers. How is it that there are natural barriers only for the deprived and there are no natural barriers for the privileged? And this is when you started looking to at geography, not merely as a list of cities, towns, heights, population, but the impact of all that on human lives. And and that and and the idea that you had to generate data and that you had to analyze that data. And then you had to formulate your theories based on your data generation. And then you had to go and test it in the field. And then gradually evolve a situation where a discipline which was only, which is the highest mountain in India, which is the deep, broadest river in India. This is what we taught. We were taught in schools and even in colleges, you know. From that to move into social geography, into economic geography, into human geography, this is the change that happened. And this is the change that happened primarily through the contributions of people like Ajaz Sahab. So we as, and I am now a failed geographer, but all those who are professionally as teachers, professors, uh, academics in the field of geography, we need to understand this, that it is the work of people like Ajaz Sahab that has made geography into a discipline that is impinges deeply on our own understanding of this country. So it's a great honor for me personally to be able to uh, to be invited here to preside over this and I'll humbly request Atiyapa to deliver the first Professor Ejaz Ahmed Memorial Lecture. Thank you. Thank you sir. I think I'll stand. Can you see me? <laughs> you can take it somewhere else. I don't need that. Okay. okay. Good afternoon. Uh, I think it's already 12. Uh, okay. Uh, I have a bad throat, so I might, you know, I mean, just have to wait and rest it for a while in the bit in between my talk. Uh, I wish to thank IIG for giving me this opportunity to commemorate one of my valued teachers and a much regarded colleague at JNU for almost three decades, Professor Ejazuddin Ahmed. Professor Ahmed was someone I grew up with as a geographer. To celebrate him as my teacher, in fact with him celebrate all my teachers, I will talk about my academic journey and about those teachers who were my co-wayfarers. Walking along with them, I became who I am. Walking along with them, I became who I am today. Geography is a separate, well-established discipline in India is 100 years old, and I have been fortunate to have shared almost 60 years of this journey. The discipline has a wide Kaleidoscopic canvas, and in my talk today, I will try to remember the geographers who have painted this canvas for me. There is nothing in the script that is academically profound or even useful, and I hope my students here will forgive me for this rambling. I only wish to acquaint you with some of the geographers who wrote the books that you may have read or the research papers that you may have consulted. 
I assure you it will be useful to know them not only as your teachers, but also as the hu beautiful human beings that they were. When you are reading a book, you unconsciously develop an image of the personality of the author. When I started my research on colonial cities in the early 1970s, the only book that addressed my intellectual curiosity was T.G. McGee's The Urbanization Process in the Third World, published in 1971. It became my Bible and McGee my Messiah. For me, McGee was a ponderous, very serious, lost in thought person. But in 1980, I had the great opportunity of spending a fortnight with him in a conference at the East West Center, Hawaii. Over my stay, I discovered that this profound thinker was also a simple, unassuming, fun-loving man who, while traveling in, in, in India, had slept in dharamshalas and had a heart full of warmth and empathy for the third world. His books for me since then speak a different language. I had sent my very nostalgic and autobiographical version of this paper to Sachidanand a few days ago when his sword was hanging on my head to submit something. I had to delete major portions of it to be able to present it to you today. In this talk, I wish to share with you the times and circumstances that shaped students of geography of my generation. When I say my generation, I refer to the cohort which after passing class 10th entered the intermediate or degree colleges in, the, in or around the 1960s. I, was, I will focus mostly on the formative decades of geography from the 1970s to the 1990s. In the subsequent de decades, my students became my co-wanderers as heads of departments, consultants, professors, bureaucrats, and even a prime minister. I will talk about them some other day. The early decades of geography in India were not ordinary times for the discipline, as it was just beginning to find its feet in the country and spread out from a few well-established universities, mostly in North India, into newer universities. The discipline was also trying to come out of the British mold. The geography faculty was groping tentatively for the research areas to initiate in their departments and at the same time struggling to shed the influence of their foreign mentors who were strong academics and very strong personalities. I begin by foregrounding my reminiscences with my school days in the mid-1950s. I got my education up to class 10 in a small convent school in a then small railway town called Gorakhpur in eastern Uttar Pradesh. If you look back at your childhood, somewhere lurks a school teacher or two who determined what his subjects uh, were going to be your favorites. My favorite teacher was a geography teacher, Mrs. Luther. Geography was taught through Dudley Stamps books. Only in higher classes, our teaching was done through books by Indian writers. I do not remember who wrote those Indian books in geography, but we depended on books called Kunji in Hindi, which meant keys to a subject. These were written by some enterprising young teachers and printed on cheap paper. These Kunjis were our Google. Dudley Stamp's narration of Indian regions used to trigger my imagination about the then far off places in South India from where my Madrasi friends came. In those days, anyone coming from deep south was called a Madrasi in North India. Dudley Stamp introduced me to Burma, now Myanmar, a country I found exciting because my uncle had fought there in the World War II for the British Army. Little did I know that one day I would have changed, I would have a changed opinion about Dudley Stamp and also about the innocent terms he was using, such as the tropics and tropical geography, which symbolized colonial expansion, imperialism, racism, and Eurocentrism. Dudley Stamp was a strong supporter of the empire, one might even say complicit in empire, and had greatly influenced the Royal Geographical Society, the IGU, and the teaching of geography in India and Britain in those early days. He was knighted in 1965 and was much awarded by associations of geography all over the world. Such were the times. I would like to <coughs> digress here and as a backdrop, give some important milestones in the development of the discipline in geography. One may even ask, who is the father of Indian geography? By consensus, the answer is James Rennell. He's, the, he's known as the father of ethnography too. He was a surveyor and engineer in the East India Company and was deputed to survey the Bengal River system and map it for exploring inter -water, inland waterways for trade. Are you showing those? Okay. 
Geography began to be taught in schools in India in the later part of the 19th century, since it was considered beneficial for those who would like to join the army or were in the East India Company's services. Formal geography departments in India started being opened in the late 1920s. The year of their establishment in the major universities um, and the geographers, mostly from the second generation with whom I had the privilege to interact, is given in, in this table. It may be of interest to know that the Department of Geography at Rangoon University is four years older than any Indian department. It was set up by Professor Dudley Stamp and his wife using the curriculum of Lord London University. In 1937, O.H.K. Spate, who joined it for some years when he did not get a job in England, he was part of the faculty. <laughs> Spate, although brilliant and original, was considered too radical for a conventional academic career in England, so the British universities would not accommodate him. The Geographical Association of Societies founded during the colonial period played a vital role in disseminating geographical knowledge and promoting geographical research. Journals like The Geographer, published from Aligarh in 1925, Geographical Journal, published from Madras in 1926, The Geographical Review of India, published from Calcutta in 1936, and the Bulletins of National Geographical Society of India, published uh, from BHU in 1946, popularized geography. Geography at the graduation level in the 1960s, uh, I would talk about that them now. My four years of intermediate, that is class 11th and class 12th in those days, and two years of graduation were spent at Loreto Convent College at Lucknow. Those four years of geography between 1960 and 1964 were dull as the teachers kept changing and nothing exciting happened in the classes. The only redemption was that the college library where I was a student helper was quite well equipped and I had free access to an Elmira full of well-chosen textbooks. I learned geography on my own. Urban geography interested me the most. Self-teaching was an enjoyable experience, but created a sort of distance from the subject. When I look back, nothing very exciting was happening in urban geography and other places of learning in India too. Most graduate students were being taught urban morphological models developed by Chicago School, uh, by Mayor Ullman and Harris. Their work on functional classification of towns and the work of German geographers Losch and Christeller were drilled into us. The first anthology of papers published in urban geography, which was Harold Mayer's Readings in Urban Geography, was published in 1959. This became our basic text. We were unaware of the <laughs> radical change that was taking place in geography in the early 1960s by Ullman and Garrison's students at the University of Washington that came to be labeled as quantitative geography. The full ramifications of this change were, however, revealed at the University of Chicago by Brian Berry a few years later. But for my generation in India, we had to wait to become aware of this revolution until we reached our post-graduation in the mid-1960s. My post-graduation was done at uh, AMU, and they were wondrous two years for me, and these were between 1964 and 1966. After I graduated, I was restless and confused because I wanted to have a career other than teaching. Teaching was the oft-beaten track for middle-class women at that time. I wanted to do something different. Fortunately, a timely chance meeting with a relative of a family friend decided on my career option to my satisfaction. He was freshly minted as an urban and regional planning from, planner at, from IIT Kharagpur after obtaining an MA in geography from BHU. I shared my plight with him and he advised me that I could consider following his career path and get a master's degree in geography which would, would get me into architecture and regional planning either at IIT Kharagpur or at the School of Planning and Architecture in Delhi. I considered this option seriously, and since Lucknow University did not have a geography department, I decided to head for Aligarh Muslim University, where I was told the departments were very good. The year was 1964. <clears throat> I will now go into a little non-academic digression and talk to you about the Department of Geography at AMU, in which me and Professor Ajaz's early academic world was chiseled. Since Suhail Hashmi Sahab, the chair of the session, has spent his childhood in AMU, this may resonate with him. I like to call him Sahab today. <laughs> All my st 
student life until I reached AMU was spent in convents. My school was run by Carmelite nuns from Kerala and my college by Irish nuns. They created for us a cocooned, caring world of rules and regulations. The freedoms allowed were limited to the realms of the sports you could choose to play or the straight thoughts which you thought and which could not be controlled by them. I found that AMU was somehow similar. It was still a university with many old traditions intact and some old world conservatism. The department did not have its own building and was situated in a portion of the oldest boys hostel which is called the SS Hall of the university and it faced the stadium grounds. The classes were held on the first floor and were accessed by a staircase inside the building. I was instructed by my senior women students not to use this inside staircase as it was meant for the faculty and for the male students only. But I had to use the one staircase which was at the rear of the building. This staircase was constructed in the early 1930s for Asafia Kidwai, the first women student of the department. She was still working in the university as the head of the Department of Geography in the Women's College and was a legend. This restriction was the first alarm bell that rang for me in Aligarh. The second alarm bell rang for me later in the day. I had from my childhood days been allowed to use a bicycle to go to school or to college because the roads used to be safe and distances were easily negotiable. I had carried my bicycle to Aligarh. I had also been a little intrigued when I noticed that there were only two other cycles in the corridors of the hostel. On the first day of my cycling journey to the department with two of my classmates on a rickshaw, I did see some sur surprised faces on the way. Once I reached the department, I looked around for a place to park, found a cycle stand near the rear sta staircase which I had been told to use to reach my classroom and I parked there. Then took the staircase which landed me in a small room where two girls were sitting. It was a waiting room for girls where we were supposed to stay and keep peeping into the classroom through the door to see if the boys had settled in their chairs and the teacher had arrived and taken the podium. We had to then, then walk quietly into the classroom and sit on the front bunches. This, is, this was meant for girls. The girls had to immediately leave the room after the teacher finished lecturing and had to go back to the small cloister and wait for the next class. I have given a picture, I think it's of the history department in the 1940s when girls were put behind a curtain in a classroom, but the girls did go to study. Our first class was taken by Professor Shafi, the head of the department. In measured tones, he told us about the MA course requirements. He was going to teach us physical geography and geomorphology. The basic textbooks and the must-reads were going to be the classics in physical geography, Woolridge and Morgan, Stroller and Monkhaus. For each topic, there was also going to be a supplementary book. I wonder how many now read those classics which, were made, which, which we were made to read from the contents to the last page. Soon after the class, the second warning bell rang for me. My cycle episode had been narrated to Professor Shafi by the department's peon, who was also his reporter. I was summoned, offered a chair, and then in the same measured tone in which he gave his lectures, he asked why I preferred a cycle to a cycle rickshaw. I fumbled something about convenience. After this unsatisfactory answer from me, he asked me where I had parked my cycle. I replied at the only stand near the department that I could see. I was told that the cycle stand was for the boys and, should I, and I should not be using it. I should bring my bicycle inside the building and park it in the space the faculty uses for their cycles. Faculty members those days used to either walk or cycle to the department. I was quite intimidated, but I soon realized I was wrong. In a very conservative society, most rules for women in AMU had been made for their safety and to safeguard the reputation of the institution. Many girls were first generation admission seekers in a co-educational institution and their courageous initiative was not to be jeopardized. We soon found out that until our previous batch, girls were not even allowed to use the department's library after classes were over and were not allowed on the yearly Bharat Darshan geographical tour. Not being allowed to use the best geography library in India suffocated me. One day I mustered up the courage to speak to Professor Shafi about this. He asked to me to give him time and to think about it and to consult the faculty.
After two days, we were called from a little room and were told that we could stay in the library until 4 p.m. Classes used to be over by 1 p.m. This gave us girls three hours of library time. From the day this permission was given, Professor Shafi stopped going home for lunch and stayed in the department as long as we were there in the library. To our surprise, we were even allowed to come accompany the class for the Bharat Darshan Yatra. Two battles were won and two new traditions were set peacefully and quietly. We, however, obediently continued to use our separate staircase because it was historic and legendary. I gradually realized that in this almost surrealistic world, created not by any brand of fundamentalism, but by ingrained traditions and a culture all its own, there were freedoms allowed that would help a student to fully explore his or her academic potential in AMU. The department was like a big family and the teachers kept a protective eye on both men and women students. Dissent was tolerated if expressed within the limits of propriety. Debate was encouraged. Girls were not only led, but could lead. The faculty in the department was exceptional in many ways, academically accomplished, affectionate, and very friendly. A few of them were quite radical, all others progressive and liberal. Professor Ejaz was the youngest member of the faculty inducted two years ago in 1962. Professor Monis Reza was no longer a part of the faculty when I joined the department. He had left the university for other assignments. Fortunately, he continued to visit the department for a seminar or a lecture, and they'd, that gave us occasion to meet him. He kept track of me as an external examiner for some of my papers. Among the senior faculty, Professor Shafi, Professor Arnes, and Professor Raza had been batchmates in their MA course. For doctoral work, Professor Shafi had proceeded to the London School of Economics and was mentored by Dudley Stamp. Professor Anas Saha went to Australian National University to work with OHK Spate, and Professor Raza never submitted himself to a mentor. After his post-graduation, he found what he considered a more meaningful occupation for him. He spent most of his time staying underground in Kanpur to organize factory labor. Underground because the freedom movement was on and he was a member of the CPI. He lost one of his lungs to tuberculosis in this period while he was underground. He was taken to Czechoslovakia where one of his lungs was taken out and for the rest of his life he just lived on one lung. Professor Muzaffar Ali, one of the very senior geographers of the country and the teacher who later uh, went and set up the Sagar University Geography Department, had taught all three of them. His reported observation about them was Shafi is diligent, Anas is intelligent and Monis is sharp. All three proved themselves completely worthy of the observation of the teacher. I will here only not talk about two geographers at AMU who laid the foundation of my understanding of cities and regions, the two geographical entities that became my concern when I pursued my career in urban and regional planning. Urban geography was taught by Dr. Aziz Tonki. He was a light-hearted storyteller about cities and their growth processes. He introduced us to some interesting readings before plunging us into Kristaller, Ziff, and Ullman and Harris. We began with Lewis Mumford's The City in History. That book teaches the city as the actor in a narrative written in an ornate, organic style. It leads you to critical thinking about cities historically grew as three-dimensional spatial units with all, with all the beauty and all the ugliness man could create in them. As the course proceeded, my decision to pursue urban planning as a career was reinforced. Fortunately, during my post-graduation, Urban Joffe was being shaken out of its monotony by Brian Berry, who was publishing feverish, feverishly at the University of Chicago. He had, he had begun by refining the central place theory and had introduced the analysis of urban systems, which eventually laid the foundation of analytic urban geography. Our library, library gave us easy access to all that Brian Berry was writing. Professor Anas introduced us to regions in geography. He was a very treasured student of OHK Spate, the regional geographer par excellence. Spate, who was, we were told, treated Anas Sahab like his own son. And there was a great bond between them because once swimming together, Anas Sahab had saved Spate from drowning. Professor Anas make, made Professor Anas could 
Big regions come alive in a bewildering interplay of myriad regional processes created by nature and shaped by man. In his class, regions transcended their physicality, be it the Nile Valley, the primitive Papua New Guinea, or the diverse monsoon-washed South Asia. Professor Ijaz had recently completed his doctoral work on the Indian desert and had joined the faculty. He was assigned to design a course based on his thesis. It was the first time in the department that such a recognition was given to a doctoral thesis and to a doctoral student. We were the second batch he taught. He looked stern and serious all the time. Our first class with him began with the, with the usual protocol. We generally avoided looking at the teachers, but out of curiosity, I stared at him. A very young face with a small build, unimposing, someone who could easily go unnoticed. When he started to speak, the class was initially startled and then mesmerized. He gradually unfolded before us vista upon vista of the great Indian desert. It was regional geography at its best. He had imbibed the spirit of teaching from Professor Anas, his mentor, and to it he added a very grounded understanding of how to teach regional geography of special regions. He rendered his wisdom in lucid prose and shades of poetry, the, ha the hallmark of all his lectures. Little did we know that Professor Ejaz also had a rare sense of wit and charitable sarcasm until he demonstrated in a remark he noted on the tutorial submitted by one of our batchmates. He had been, we had been asked to elaborate on some environmental issues highlighted in, in his thesis. This classmate, in a very neat handwriting, copied verbatim from the thesis, thinking that Ejaz Sa would not look at his sessional minutely enough to identify his own words. The sessional was returned by Professor Ejaz with a noting on each page, attested true copy. He, he had also signed on the margins of each page as is done in an affidavit. I considered it my great privilege that I was introduced to the multidimensionality of regions by two extraordinary geographers. They taught me how to become one with the region's society, its culture, and the joys and sorrows of its inhabitants. This helped me immensely when I was to understand the regions as a planner. The other are interactions with other geography departments while I was at AMU. Since the geography departments were few in India, we knew most of their senior faculty because they were invited to conferences, lectures, or practical examinations. The most frequent were visits by faculty from BHU, Allahabad, Sagar, Jaipur, and Jamia because of their proximity. Our interaction with BHU was special as Professor R.L. Singh and Professor Shafi had both been students of Dudley Stamp and Professor Kayasta, a revered senior teacher at BHU, had been a student of our department at AMU. I particularly remember two professors whom we found very amusing. Professor Gananathan and Professor Siddhi Deshpande, both from the Pune University. In conferences, Professor Gananathan would sit in a corner of the room with no sign of any concentration on his face, his imperious cigar hanging from his mouth, and then suddenly he would sort of wake up during the discussions and ask the trickiest, trickiest question. Professor Deshpande, on the other hand, would absorb as much as his patients allowed him in a seminar session, and then, then would take out his newspaper to solve crossword puzzles. We once caught him on camera. I think you can see. This, this is Professor Deshpande. Professor Ahmed continued to enliven the geography classes at Aligarh while I left the department in 1966 for IIT Kharagpur to pursue a degree in regional planning. However, the charisma of the AMU geography department was such that it always remained my second home. I vis visited the department as often as I could. Professor Ejaz would now meet me on a different plane, and gradually my fear of him waned. I was now part of his inner circle during conferences, where he regaled us during his parody sessions held secretly in the evenings. The stalwarts of Jaufi were observed keenly during the day, and then parodies were written about them by him. I wished I had preserved those parodies. Uh, my next leap, leap in the, into the future was into the regional planning department at IIT Kharagpur. 
My obsession, my obsession to study something different had left only one avenue for me after my MA, and that was a course in urban and regional planning. In 1966, there were only two institutions in India that offered professional courses, courses in the field. My natural choice was the School of Planning, planning and Architecture in Delhi, but it had no hostel for girls, I was told. So I looked up IIT Kharagpur and I applied there. Since there were only 35 women in the entire IIT at that time in all departments, the director was always keen to admit women candidates. I was, I was admitted along with another girl from BHU. The tone, only two of us had applied, two women candidates had applied. The director later told me that I was the first Muslim girl who was seeking admission to an IIT. So he would have, said, he would have never said no to me even if I was a very average student. The director was Professor Vian Prasad, an architect planner trained in London, who was uh, the who had prepared the first regional plan for the Damodar Valley Car Corporation, the DVC, about which we have all studied in school. He had also started the first professional degree level training course in regional planning at IIT and had established the Institute of Town Planners, which later shifted to Delhi. There was only one job for teacher in the department, Dr. C. R. Pata. Pathak, who initially worked on the DVC plan with Dr. Prasad and was later absorbed into the faculty. We were the first batch of regional planners admitted for a degree course that was between 1966 and 1968 at IIT Kharagpur. The faculty was borrowed from other departments and was a mixed bag of architects, civil engineers, and one economist and also one sociologist. The lack of appropriate faculty was made up by the visiting, visiting faculty. The geographers who visited us most frequently were Dr. L.S. Bhatt and Dr. K.V. Sundaram, and an eminent urban economist, Dr. A.N. Bose. We would occasionally also get academically inclined bureaucrats to lecture us. An ex exceptional among them was Badal Sarkar, the chief planner of the Calcutta Metropolitan Planning Organization. He was also a very radical playwright who had scripted two acclaimed plays of those days, Evam Indrajit and Pagla Ghoda. His lectures were a treat. The teaching at IIT was different from what I was used to at the university. There were very few, few formal lectures by the faculty. Our class consisted of architects, civil engineers, and geographers. The teacher would come to class, give a physical planning related problem, drop some hints, and then leave it to us to complete the work, say within three days or within very strict time deadlines. Both regional and urban planning was taught in, the, the, taught in those days was drawing board based and design, design oriented planning. Regional planning was just evolving and there were no textbooks written yet. Fortunately, in 1967, that was in my final year, John Fried Friedman and William Alonso edited uh, edited book, Regional Development and Planning a Reader was published. It became our savior. Though it was an edited anthology of published papers, it at least made these papers available to us. We were also handicapped as we had only two core faculty members for the course, Dr. C. R. Pathak, the only geographer, and Dr. G. B. K. Rao, a civil engineer with some expertise in planning legislation. So in most of the time in the classroom, Dr. Pathak would come, teach, go. Dr. G. B. K. Rao would, would come and teach, go. Then Dr. Pathak would come and teach, go. So this is, was the uh, daily routine. The one important thing we imbibed from this multidisciplinarity was that we learned how to think coherently in many directions and then learned to web this wide diverse knowledge into a meaningful planning solution. We also learned the art of visual presentation of our ideas. Some notab notable developments were taking place in a department in which I had go got involved. In 1967, Walter Izard at the University of Pennsylvania had been looking for institutional affiliation for Regional Science Association International in India. He approached our institute and Professor Prasad as the director readily agreed. The onus of starting the India chapter of the Regional Science Association was put on Dr. Pathak and through him, and through him on his students. I and my, my batchmate, Arun Chattopadhyay, whom some of you may know, is one of the best rural development planners in the country. Uh, we did all the initial legwork of the Association for the Regional Science. After the first year, the course required us to do an internship in a government planning department for three months. After those three months of official planning, I knew that was not what I wanted to do. 
that is make master plans for cities where people were just a number and all one did was to calculate the hectares of land needed for roads, houses, hospitals, schools, etc. By the time I reached the penultimate dissertation stage, I was very disillusioned by the design-oriented data-based planning. The final review of our performance does, was done by the Chief Town Planner, Government of India. Uh, he offered me a job of TCPO where he worked, that is a town and country planning organization, which was based in Delhi. And Professor Prasad, the director, offered three faculty positions to our class. Aran Chattopadhyay and I were selected for two of them. I accepted the position. Teaching had finally allured me. Dr. Pathak and Aran Chattopadhyay were my colleagues now. Together we tried to give a new direction to the regional planning coursework. We undertook studies on regional disparities. We launched the Indian Journal of Regional Science in 1968 and organized, and organized an international regional science conf conference at the Gokhale Institute in Pune in 1969. This conference was attended by many economists who became luminaries, luminaries later on. Walter Izard was the chief guest. These early years of my teaching between 1969 and 1971 were politically disturbed nationally and internationally. The Vietnam War had peaked and anti-war protests had spread all over the world. In the USA, many university professors were asking the US government fundamental and hard questions. The student movement for educational reforms were in full force in Europe. Mao Zedong's China was questioning the four olds, the old in ideas, culture, customs, and habits. Closer home, Indira Gandhi was in power. After some uh, turmoil, the Bangladesh war had been won. The refugees were all over West Bengal. The Naxalite movement was spreading and was being policed. The beating and the cries of Naxals could be heard in the campus police station, which was next to my residence. It was very unnerving. Many academic and non-academic questions had started bothering me as a teacher as too. I was an intellectually, I, it was an intellectually restless period for many of us. Some chance happenings led me to leave Kharagpur in June 1971 for GNU. Bengal had grown, grown on me in those five years. I loved it. It was emotionally not an easy decision, but leave I must. The call came from JNU in 1970. Uh, while at Kharagpur, I was selected to go to Poland for a year to associate with a leading advocate of socialist spatial planning, Piotr Zaremba. I went to Delhi for my travel formalities and met Professor Raza because I wanted to share with him my excitement about my first trip to a foreign land. He was now a professor of geography and the think tank for a new university being established. This was the Jawaharlal Nehru University housed in two rooms in the annex of Vigyan Bhavan. He took me to meet the Vice Chancellor, Mr. G. Parthasathi, a career diplomat. GP, he was called. GP's charisma captivated me. In a very pleasant and brief conversation, he had unearthed my CV. After a couple of months, I was contacted by Professor Raza's younger brother, Professor Mehdi, who, was my, who had been my teacher at AMU. The newly formed Center for the Study of Regional Development at JNU had ad advertised for some posts and I was asked to apply. I discussed this with Dr. Pathak. He had, been, he had seen the advertisement as, and was keen on one of the senior posts and suggested that both of us could give JNU a try. The play of subsequent events landed me and Dr. Pathak in JNU. Poland had to be shelved at G GP's behest. JNU, for me, was a big leap into uncertainty. Module my, by, module my, by module, GP and Professor Raza had conceptualized the idea of a postgraduate university for a country like India, unified yet diverse, inclusive, egalitarian, and academically innovative. The academic program was designed differently. Instead of compartmentalized departments, centers of studies were carved based on core social science disciplines. Each center uh, used to incorporate allied disciplines, converge them, interacted with them, and amalgamated them. Professor Raza vigorously tested this multidisciplinary approach at the Center for the Study of Regional Development, his own center. He was leading a diverse flock of social scientists in the center, consisting of geographers, economists, demographers, geomorphologists, but with a geographer's perspective. 
he himself was essentially a philosopher, part visionary, part dreamer, part poet, and in totality, an intellectual bindas. He had been an ardent, ardent student of philosophy, both as it was enshrined in books and as it played out in life, and taught him the, his, his lessons through his struggles while fighting injustices of all kinds. We admitted the first batch of MPhil students in 1971 and of the MA batch in 1972. Our chair, chair today belongs to this MA batch. Professor Ejaz, that is Suhail Lashmi. <clears throat> Professor Ejaz joined this CSRD experiment in 1972. He brought his brand of thinking and teaching to the center. Geography at CSRD, Professor Raza first worked on the mindset of the faculty. The curriculum had to be modern, but the teachers traditional. In the curriculum, we had to do away with whatever was obsolete, but as teachers, we had to respect the old traditions of learning and teaching in the true Gurukul Shishya Parampara. It was the duty of the faculty to make the students feel like family and then strive to keep this family together. We were reminded often that each student had utility and hence a right to reach his or her maximum potential. Um, Professor Raza would time and again tell us that, as a good, that a good teacher is not the one who takes a horse and teaching, teaches it to run faster, but a good teacher is one who takes a mule and teaches it to run like a horse. One thing was declared an unforgivable sacrilege, that was a teacher missing a class. Geography as a discipline was taking a turn in this decade. It was an op opportune, opportune time to reinvent it. I was asked to formulate a course in urban geography and another in regional development. This was exciting. Urban geography was shifting from the ideogra ideographic to the nomothetic approach and was acquiring the apparatus of modern science that was quantification and testing of laws, models, and theories. This resonated with the then current buzzword, socio-science. Brian Berry at the University of Chicago was riding on the cusp of the quantitative revolution in geography and was converting traditional urban geography to analytic urban geography, which was contemporary, multidisciplinary, and comprehensive in per perspective. The Journal of Ur Urban Geography was started in 1980, and urban geography had 40 special specialty groups in the AAG, Association of American Geographers. The first signs of reaction to this brand of urban geography had also come uh, in the same decade from David Harvey. And we at, uh, I personally, myself as an urban geographer, was getting very uncomfortable with the way we were teaching urban geography during the 1970s through Brian Berry's quantitative revolution. Uh, I was attracted to David Harvey's writings. David Harvey was scrapping the veneer, veneer of quantification for geography and was trying to root it in Marxist theory. He had little interest in cities as material creations. For him, cities reflected societal and political processes and were a concentration of economic wealth and political power. He refuted theory based on empirical research methods and policy recommendations that were based on social scientific research in geography. <coughs> The Chicago paradigm, which had gained prominence in the 1960s, had lost it in the 1970s and the 1980s. In the field of regional development, John Friedman in 1971 finally came up with a tentative theory of regional development based on his work in Venezuela. Economic history, economic uh, growth theories, and trade theories were being unabashedly <clears throat> borrowed and justified in the study of regional development. This led to a proliferation of reference material and helped me in developing a theoretical course in regional development. Uh, but thank you. But that was still based on a lot of borrowed economics. After I had become a little comfortable with my teaching responsibilities, I started looking for a topic for my doctoral research. Professor Reza was my mentor. He often dropped me a hint that Indian geography was like a dinosaur with a huge body and a very tiny head. The tiny head represented theory, and the large body, the accumulation of case studies. He wanted the center to rectify the situation. 
During this period of probing, probing for a thesis topic, my friends in the history department prompted me to see Dr. Chris Bailey's interpretation of colonial urbanization in India. He was a professor of imperial and Indian history at the Cambridge University. His writings were being vehemently refuted by Indian Marxist scholars. This exchange of conflicting ideas came to be referred to as the deindustrialization, deurbanization debate in Indian, in Indian history. I read some of this literature and it interested me. I, however, felt that something was missing in the arguments, and that was a lack of evidence based on hard data and regional manifestation of the processes both of deurbanization and deindustrialization. I wished to fill some of these lacunae in my thesis. David Harvey's work was gripping our attention around this period, especially my attention. I assiduously read his Social Justice and the City. It's not an easy text to navigate, but a slow, careful reading does give theoretical insights. I got clues from it to deduce a theory of colonial urbanization. It gave me an understanding of the global form of economic imperialism based on the production of surplus value. This became the pivotal point for some of the theoretical formulations in my thesis, both about colonial urbanization and about the tertiarization of the colonial urban economy which was a proxy for deindustrialization. I supported this with data from the British census from, 19, from 1872 to 1921 for the eastern half of British India. The examiner was Professor Goldsmith, a very senior Marxist geographer and a revered scholar at Cornell University in the USA and a, a senior to David Harvey. I treasure his report on my work. Professor Raza's style of mentoring as a thesis supervisor meant no interference and minimal help. When I faced a mental block, say, uh, for instance, while conceptualizing rural urban migration in the, cost in the context of colonial primate cities, in my thesis, he would ask me to read old birhas, folk songs of separation from Bihar or Eastern Pradesh. I wondered why. This suggestion made no sense to me. But when I did read some of the folk birha geet, in one of them I found that the village women called the railway trains passing by their village a sautan, the second wife, who sna snatches away their husbands and takes them to Calcutta. How better can a supervisor lead you to explain the agony of hundreds of rural families who faced, faced poverty-ridden migration to colonial urban ghettos? I would sometimes share my words with Professor Raza's, about Professor Raza's way of mentoring with Ijaz Sahab. He would only give a half cynical, half amused smile in return. He knew the ways of the master. I am tempted here to narrate an incidence about Professor Raza's handling of difficult students. Imagine a class, and in that class is Suhail Hashmi, a compulsive smoker those days. Muni Saab's first lecture uh, to the class has begun. Suhail feels the urge to smoke and decides on his first strategy. His strategy was overcome your opponent, make the first move. He takes out his cigarette pack from his pocket and puts it determinedly on his desk. Then comes out the matchbox and is kept next to the pack. All this while he's eyeing the professor and the professor is eyeing him. Then in one brave attempt, a cigarette is taken out from the pack by him and it is lit. The professor quietly asks, Akele, Akele, smoking alone. <laughs> a second cigarette is then, then lit by the student, handed over to the prof to be accepted cheerfully by him. The class laughs and is won over. The 1970s and 1980s saw the coming of age of the older departments in the country, led by some very dynamic geographers. These departments also tended to specialize in certain branches of geography and develop their, their own identities. Uh, the ones that we interacted most with, as I said earlier, were BHU and the uh, Allahabad University. Uh, Jaipur University had come up and it was very dynamic and all the most of the North Indian universities. In South India, Pune University always welcomed us and we welcomed them and the Madras University. 
The International Geographical Union, uh, Union's Congress in India was held in 1968 and introduced a geography department, their faculty and their areas of strength to foreign universities. That, that led to an increased international interaction and has continued with financial support from the UGC and the ICSSR. CSRD also expanded and diversified. Some very eminent economists and demographers joined the faculty and enlarged its frontiers. Research in interests have a ratchet effect. My research-based interaction with Indian geographers somehow waned during the 1980s because of my involvement with urban history and my doctoral work. A group of senior historians had established the Urban History Association of India in 1980, and I was made one of the founder members. I got pulled into their activities and most of my research thereafter has been done with them. My work in geography during this period and, some, and, that, and in the subsequent decade also got, uh, was linked to French universities where I had an opportunity to teach. The French geographers form circles of affinity that largely cut across disciplinary boundaries. It has been a pleasure to work with them and on esoteric subjects ranging from historical territorial identities to the use of big data and maritime trade studies. During the last decade, I found myself writing on everything but geography. This capability of multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary thinking is the power geography gives us. Urban geography in the 1990s experienced increasing fragmentation, specialization, and, and insularity. There have been competing versions and philosophical explorations. Los Angeles was created as a new exemplar of contemporary urban processes and of post-modernism. The material built central city has been abandoned. Attention is now diverted from metropolitan to the global, to the suburb, Silicon City, cities, edge cities, financial capitals, global urban networks, and the new urbanism. Urban geography in the 21st century is a cockpit of competing schools of thought. To make this diversity invigorating, debates have to be robust and healthy and, con and not confrontational, which sometimes is happening. Uh, this has not touched Indian geography yet in a big way, and I'm glad that I'm, I have opted out of the system because, uh, I mean, these new trends, they're so conflicting and so problematic that I don't want to torture my brain with any more thinking of this kind. When my journey as a teacher came to an end after three years at IIT Kharagpur, almost 45 years at JNU, and five years at School of Planning and Architecture, Delhi, which I joined after I retired from JNU, uh, I looked back on these decades with some awe and some remorse. Uh, I have awe at my teachers who helped, who shaped me with the brilliance of their scholarship and the firmness of their convictions. Or at my colleagues for giving me endless hours of intellectual stimulation, humor, and poetry. Or at my students for their achievements and for the care and warmth they give me. Remorse is only one. I could have done more. I would end by paying my homage to Professor Ajaz, a man I was privileged to know as an esteemed teacher and a valued colleague. He was a person with substance, style, and sensitivity. His sensitivity made him a profound analyst of social reality of India. We owe much to him. I express my gratitude to, uh, to IIG, to Professor Sachidanand Sinha, and to Suhail for being here, and to all those who have endeavored to institute this memorial lecture series for my esteemed teacher, who deserves every honor for the scholarship he has left for generations of students and for nurturing geography, which he so loved. Thank you. In the beginning of uh, Atiyapal's lecture, she had said that she had sent a draft to Sachi and Sachi. Sachidanand, and uh, she is what is she is presenting is a much edited version. Now I have one request to make that the section that she has cut out she should re-include and I hope that this can be published and because the sweep of the lecture today 
traces how geography has changed and how it has been influenced by what was happening abroad and how it has taken what is relevant and modified or changed or rejected what was not relevant for us and how that entire discipline from the way we were taught people of my generation were taught when we were in school from then to where geography has reached today this uh, memorial lecture would actually be something that geographers should seriously read because the the way she has been able to map the entire evolution of geographical studies and the discipline of geography in the last 60 years is really remarkable and uh, again i would say uh, that uh, we were fortunate that atiyapa was asked to deliver the first ejaz sahab memorial lecture and i hope that this is continued and we get similar contributions in the years to come thank you very much thank you so much we have come to the end of the first ajazuddin ahmed memorial lecture there is an announcement a video on professor ajazuddin ahmed shall be played now and we are also going to begin our uh, second parallel thematic session on public policy and geographies of social well being in mcb room number 311 those interested are requested to kindly proceed to the venue thank you